So this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about, and we're going to uh, begin by sort of getting at this question of why complex trait human genetics is so difficult, um, and then go through each of the steps that you would do if you were actually doing this work. The first question you would get asked on an NIH grant application is, is your phenotype heritable? And so some evidence of heritability or doing a study to determine heritability is often the first step in, in, in a genetic study. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about heritability and how you define that. And then identifying disease phenotypes, so that's a critical issue. Um, the difference between a subphenotype and an intermediate phenotype. Um, how you want to look at those things. Then developing your study design. Um, the paper that I just was telling you about, this paper that's coming out in science, these people looked at two relative genetic isolates, the population of Finland and the uh, uh, saguenay lac saint jean population in northeast Quebec, French Canadians. So these are uh, populations where they had a limited number of founders. And so uh, the thought is, is that they're more genetically homogeneous and it might be easier to find genes in these populations. But what's the big concern if you found a gene in the Finns? What would be your biggest concern about, about, about that? Exactly. That, you know, maybe that gene might not replicate or be a significant gene in an outbred population you know, in a country such as the United States where there's a lot of uh, um, ethnic variation and diversity. So uh, it, it may be easier to find genes in uh, genetic isolates, but it may be more difficult uh, 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 in terms of their generalizability. So give me some other examples of relative genetic isolates around the world, populations that would be considered relative genetic isolates. Iceland, Iceland yes, absolutely Iceland. So that's the, where DECODE is, is working. DECODE is our number one competitor in COPD research. They're the only company that, that's actually doing uh, um, COPD stuff. What else? Where else could you go? Really? How are the genetic isolates in South America? Um, just um, uh, tribal populations in South America? I'm not sure. sure. I just remember. Oh, maybe. What, what, what might be the disadvantage of a tribal population or a di disadvantage of a, <coughs> of a small island population like Tristan de Cunha, which is where they first went to do genetic isolate work in, in asthma? Yeah, small number of people. So you, you know, you got a limited number of uh, meioses in a population like that. You're not going to get too many recombinations. So you just sort of run out of gas because you don't have a big enough sample size. Swiss, Swiss family stuck in the Alps somewhere. Possibly, um, the Finns, the Swiss, uh, the northern uh, um, Netherlands, um, the um, Ashkenazi Jews, um, Costa Rica. Why? Why Costa Rica? Why Costa Rica? Because Costa Rica is surrounded by volcanoes. It was the one place in Central America that uh, the span you know, there's not a huge Spanish influx because there was no gold there. So there's a limited number of Spanish founders in the 15th century. They pushed the Indians to the periphery and they settled the, the Central Valley of Costa Rica. So you've got this. 200 founders in the 14th century, very little intermarriage, and perfect church records, very large pedigrees. It's one of the, it's probably the closest next to the saguenay lac saint jean population in Quebec, uh, 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 genetic isolates uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Wow. And we're actually doing a big study there. We actually have six big pedigrees with over 120 people in each pedigree. Um, we've just finished the collection of these pedigrees. We're about to do a genome scan uh, that uh, Tom is actually doing for us. So I just have a question. Most of the people are isolated by geography, which you've mentioned, with the exception of like, the, the Ashkenazi Jews, right? So uh, can, can, can you broaden uh, your, I guess, the definition of genetic isolate to include things like economic, like, like things that usually isolate people, like, you know, royal families back in the old days, and they only intermarried because of social status and, and that's, but now there's things where, you know, 
people of certain economic status may only, and in the coming years, may only you know, see a certain set of people where they marry and. Yeah, it turns out I think that geography is actually a much better. I think that. Yeah, I think. Look, if you. If you. If families, I mean, people have a chance to procreate by physical proximity or will. <laughs> I think the geography is a lot better. Uh, uh, um, historically, it's a much more reliable guide to a genetic isolate than any sort of social convention. I think uh, 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 exactly for the reasons that but Zach... I mean, aren't, aren't groups like the, the Ashkenazi Jews... Because there's so like strong, the strong social pressure. Yeah, like they need on that word. The they may be the ex they may be the exception to the rule, but I think you know populations like Iceland, Costa Rica, um, Tristan da Cunha, Finland. How about the Amish? The Amish would would fall into fall into that group. The Mormons, maybe a little bit less so. Um, the big advantage of the Mormons is not so much that they're a relative genetic isolate, but that they have very large families and they have very good church records. So you know those are sort of other characteristics that sort of are helpful but the idea behind the genetic isolate is is that you've got a relatively uh, uh, um, homogeneous set of alleles that's circulating in the population. Mormons do intermarry and, and so there may be, I don't, I don't know that you'd consider them really a genetic isolate whereas uh, uh, I think that uh, the Amish and the Hutterites and the uh, um, Ashkenazis are people where there is some set of co-social conventions that those people are much more likely to uh, intermarry. The reason I ask is because it seems like uh, the trend might be, uh, you know, especially nowadays with transportation, where it is that finding geographic isolated populations is going to decline in the coming years. This isn't the this isn't the only way to do this. I mean, uh, um, I, and I think it is important to sort of make the distinction between, uh, um, you know, linkage and fine mapping, and uh, uh, um, th those two things may be somewhat different. The, the, the advantages of an outbred population is, is that the degree of linkage disequilibrium will be relatively narrow. In some of these genetic isolated populations, the degree of linkage disequilibrium can be very large. That means you can get do the do the linkage part pretty effectively, but the association part is more difficult because you've got these big LD blocks that you've got to uh, 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 work with, and you may not be able to get to 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 the gene. Um, so anyway, we'll go through the stuff. Uh, uh, um, these are sort of all of the steps that you would do in a typical study, and we'll just go through each of these. So I'm going to use asthma as my example because this is the disease I know the best, and point here is is that asthma prevalence in western developed countries has gone up a lot so do you think that this is a genetic thing or do you think it's something else so over the 20 year period sort of 80 to 2000 you've had more than a doubling in the number of cases so over a 20 year period a doubling in the number of cases genetic genetic or environment why Okay, so there are three potential, what are the three population genetic mechanisms that uh, uh, something like this could, could, uh, uh, could occur? Uh, 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 genetic explanation. Genetic explanation. So you, 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 you're, I'll give you at least half credit, but, but, but you're definitely not 100% right. Um, the first genetic mechanism would be spontaneous mutation, right? You had some spontaneous mutation and it caused this epidemic of diseases. Is that possible? Well, you already said no, it's not possible. And you're, and you're right, it's not. But you have to know what the spontaneous mutation rate is, which is about uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 8 base pairs per generation. So it's pretty low. You know, we're spontaneously mutating all of the time, but we're not spontaneously mutating fast enough to double the number of cases in a 20-year period of time. So, what's the second possible genetic mechanism? Natural selection, right? So, um, natural selection gonna do the. 
Well, particularly with a disease like asthma, where there's no selection pressure and, and, and no reproductive advantages or disadvantages, right? You all know plenty of people with asthma, and they're able to reproduce just like everybody else. So couldn't be nat natural selection. And what's the third population genetic mechanism that could? Uh, uh, uh. Mutation selection was the third one. Genetic drift. So you know you you had some mutant asthmatic that came into the American population, and over 20 years of time they intermarried with all these other people and doubled the asthma rate. Plausible or implausible? No, can't happen. Okay, so you're right. It can't be genetic. So I, I could give you, I'd give you half credit, but what, I mean, this is, most geneticists don't think like this, but they should think like this. The reality is, is that all of these genes operate in a developmental and an environmental context. All of your genes do. So the true underlying model for disease causation is gene-by-environment interaction. So it could very well be that there was some dramatic change in the environment and now that's interacting with some other genes that it wasn't inter they weren't interacting before with and now you've got this marked explosion in a number of cases and that's almost certainly is the most comprehensive uh, explanation but it would have to devolve from some sort of environmental change rather than some sort of primary change in the, in the genes. But it could easily be that there is interaction between whatever the environmental exposure is and uh, uh, some of the underlying polymorphisms that may be disease related that are different now than they were uh, back here when the uh, disease rate was a lot lower. Okay? So big health problem. I don't want to dwell on this but because uh, 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 it's not the purpose of this course. But uh, uh, um, it, it, all this means is, is that people will give you money to study this, and they, they, you know, they weren't so keen on doing that um, 20 or 30 years ago. The other important point is this disease is a disease of children. So you're going to think about, I usually tell people, 90, this is data looking at the age of onset in a, in a closed population in Olmstead County. What's the famous medical center in Olmstead County, Minnesota? Mayo. You weren't supposed to answer that. They're supposed to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic. So Mayo Clinic is everybody in Olmstead County goes to the Mayo Clinic. Now, you, you know, Saudi princes and sheiks and famous people from all over the world and uh, uh, um, uh, um, who was the king of Jordan? King uh, Hussein. He, you know, he went there for his... He went there for his, yeah, so Zach's mother, another famous person, went to the Mayo Clinic. So they get a lot of people from outside, but this data is based on the people who live in Olmstead County. Now, if you live in Olmstead County, you don't go anywhere, okay? You just sit right there and you stay there. So this was a fairly stable population, and they were to ca able to capture all of the incident asthma cases and document them because they were all... Uh, um, going to the Mayo Medical Center and, and they had their chart records. So 90% of all of the people who were diagnosed in, uh, as asthmatic in Olmstead County were diagnosed before the age of six. So this is a very, very important point. So this is the opposite of Alzheimer's disease, right? Because if you think about genetics, this is great for geneticists because I only have to wait six years from the time that the kid is born and I'm going to know whether they've got the disease phenotype or not. If I was waiting for Alzheimer's cases, it would be waiting for Godot. I'd be waiting a long time before uh, uh, um, I'd get my cases. Now, there, there's ways around that for the old people, right? And what did geneticists do? How did they find the BRCA1 gene? What did, what did they do to, to, to enhance the, the probability that you would find? If you're looking at people old, older people, how do you in, in, enrich for a genetic cause of a disease. What do you do? Education doesn't have anything to do with it, I'm afraid. No, you just, what, what characteristic of the cases would make you think it's more likely to be genetic? What? Family, f family history, but what specifically, uh, family history, age of onset, right. If you're looking for 
genetic causes of heart attacks, you're going to take the people that have heart attacks when they're age 50. So Ed Silverman, who's the world leader in COPD genetics in my laboratory, is looking for early onset COPD cases. So he gets cases where the age of onset is younger than the age of 52. So that's young. So if you're looking at Alzheimer's cases, you'd say, well, we want all of the cases of Alzheimer's people before the age of 60. And this is how Mary Claire King found BRCA1. She looked at all of the early onset breast cancer cases, people who got breast cancer in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, instead of looking at older postmenopausal women, which is almost certainly another disease. Okay? So if you're looking at old people, one of the clever ways that geneticists enrich for uh, uh, um, genetic susceptibility is by looking at early age of onset. Okay? Don't you so, a risk there of selecting potentially a special case of a particular disease? Absolutely right. It's, it's, it's a little bit like in some perverse kind of way, it's a little bit like the genetic isolate. You might find a gene that is specific for that particular type uh, of early onset disease. So you find a gene for early onset Alzheimer's but not for garden variety old age Alzheimer's that occurs in uh, uh, um, virtually everybody by the time they're 90. Um, so you're, you're, you're right. But it's a, it's a, 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 you know, we're still, and I think what geneticists would say, the early stages of this, and because we're still in the early stages, most of us would be happy if we found any gene. <laughs> so, you know, you're going to be in science if you find that early onset gene, and nobody's going to be criticizing you because it's not the gene for all uh, uh, breast cancer or all Alzheimer's. So you're not an example of low-hanging fruit. Exactly. Uh, so, a little bit more about the disease. Most of the kids are allergic. Allergy is probably the big reason why the asthma epidemic occurred. Uh, and that means that, um, you know, there's, they have this particular type of an inflammatory process where antigen presented to dendritic cells in the airways activate these uh, uh, CD4 positive T lymphocytes, which then elaborate this series of inflammatory cytokines which go to these inflammatory cells which then infiltrate the airways and set up an inflammatory reaction with coughing, wheezing, airways responsiveness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all well known, but it does sort of suggest a whole host of other potential phenotypes that you could potentially look at. Uh, and it also gets at this concept of ontogeny of the immune system where, you know, uh, uh, T null cells at some point differentiate into these Th1 and Th2 cells which are determined, their phenotype is determined by which cytokines they actually elaborate. And I've got a question mark here, but actually this particular step, which is sort of the crosstalk and interaction between these two uh, types of cells are controlled by two specific uh, uh, um, genes that elaborate cytokines, IL-10 and um, uh, TGF-beta. and um, <laughs> We, we've genotyped both of those genes uh, in, in asthma and COPD, and uh, they're, they're important in both diseases. Um, now, it's important for you to understand that I sh sort of skewed things a little bit because I told you that uh, uh, asthma is a TH2 disease, and TH2 diseases have in increased. You know, there's this increase in allergic rhinitis, food allergy, asthma, et cetera, et cetera. This novel gene that I was telling you about just a few minutes ago, it's going to come out in science. On Friday, that gene is expressed in the skin and in gut epithelium and in airway epithelium, suggesting that it's, uh, it may be important in all these different types of allergic diseases, which, again, has heightened people's interest in the gene and, and its potential uh, um, importance. But um, it's also important to recognize that Th1 diseases have also increased. So give me some examples of some Th1 diseases. So the epidemiology, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, is that people, most of the immunology community is focused on, this is why it's important if you're going to be a good geneticist, you got to really know your disease. You can't just sort of wave your hand at it and say, oh, and I think that the age of the generalist geneticist, the geneticist that's sort of, oh, you know, I'm going to study this disease and I'm going to study that disease, not with complex traits, that's not going to work. You're going to have to really know your disease because you're going to have to know the environment, you're going to have to know the 
natural history, you're going to have to know the intermediate phenotypes, and you're going to have to really understand uh, uh, the biology uh, uh, as well. The point here is, is these TH1 disease, give me an example of a TH1 disease. Well, I'm thinking about that. Um, can you, can, can you um, tell me um, the autoimmune diseases, like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, what are they for? They are TH1. So Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. TH1 disease. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, TH1 disease. Um, psoriasis. psoriasis, TH1 disease. Um, juvenile diabetes, TH1 disease. Okay? And uh, uh, the reason, so if the prevalence of these has gone up and the prevalence of the, these has gone up, people are thinking that there's something going on but further up here that uh, uh, has to do with Treg cells, cells that regulate T null cells in terms of their differentiation because it can't be just at this level that the immunologic defect is. So it, it raises the possibility that there are genes, uh, a FOXP3, uh, uh, Gitter, uh, um, uh, TBAT, a whole bunch of other genes that are proximal to the Th1, Th2, CD4 lymphocyte that may be important in all of these uh, um, uh, um, uh, immune diseases, and people are just now starting to look at, uh, um, at that. And obviously, the environmental and genetic factors that influence the differentiation of the immune system, or you, you know, how do people actually tolerate the foreign antigen, that's the kind of really simple complicated question that if you could figure out an answer to that, you'd win a Nobel Prize. So that's what my laboratory is starting to work on. Um, so this is just to show you, again, what I've already told you, that there are a bunch of factors, mostly bacteria and viruses and parasites that influence this TH1, TH2 differentiation and uh, uh, um, environmental factors that influence those things are presumed to be important. And one would want to know both the genes and the environmental factors that are involved in, in this particular disease. There happen to be a hu whole host of environmental factors that are correlates of, of those sorts of changes, and I've listed a bunch of them he here. Uh, we got very interested in this when we went to China in, in 1996 to do an asthma genetic study, and I noticed how different the environment was uh, uh, there. And you know, this left-hand category would sort of summarize what you would see if you were standing in rural China, and what you would see in terms of the uh, um, environmental exposures. Very, very low asthma rates in rural China. It's about one percent. Um, and as you, as a progressive increase in gradient in terms of disease prevalence as you march towards Beijing or Shanghai, you know, much, much higher, higher rates. Let me ask a dumb question. Is it not actually wrong that Chinese populations, I thought the families were limited, no? No. See, that's again, a little bit of knowledge is a bad thing. Yeah. If you get into rural China, actually, yeah. where, where uh, 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 farming is what everybody does. Yeah. Um, although the central government would say you can, there's a, there's a, a, a two-child policy or a one-child policy, uh, you, you know, in rural China, they just, they, they have as many children as they, they may not register them with Social Security, but if they need three kids to run the farm or four kids, they have as many kids as they want. So we, we found a lot of families with four, five, six, eight kids. Um, so why has it been presumed to be difficult to do this kind of work? What, what, what's the reason that it's difficult? And I think these are some of the reason, reasons, and, and some of them relate to the issues of study design, the things that we were talking about. You know, one is this whole idea of genetic heterogeneity, particularly if the underlying model here is gene by environment interaction, presumably you could get the same phenotype, uh, and these phenotypes are determined by multiple genes. You know, you can get the same phenotype, either high IgE or airways responsiveness, in population A with a very different constellation of genes and environmental exposures, and you can get the same thing uh, in population B with, with, with different genes. So uh, um, the, this is the genetic heterogeneity thing is a reason for focusing on a genetic isolate. 
but then you have to worry about the generalizability question. So in fact, in asthma, there are four positionally cloned genes, counting the paper that's going to come out on Friday in science. And, and of those four, the first is the one, only one that people have really attempted to replicate. Um, and it's sort of gotten mixed results. You know, there are some people that have replicated it and some people that haven't. So it's one of those genes that probably falls into this category of, it, well, it's not a major gene, it's a minor gene. It's one of the 200 genes that determine asthma, but it's not one of the top 10 in every population. What, what's your guess about um, this new gene? Is be, uh, uh, my, guess, my guess about this new gene is, is that it's a major player. Yeah. I think that, you know, uh, um, but having said that, the point that I made to the science writer who was doing this is that, you know, has, it's, you know, you know, you know it's, that, that's what science is all about is, you know, replicating this, seeing how important it really is and seeing what actually happens. You know, I mean, I, I think you can get a clue as to, uh, uh, um, whether you've got hold of an area where there's a potential major locus or not, by looking at the replicability of the linkage peaks in, in a particular reason, region for a complex trait. In other words, if you've got a region where uh, there's a linkage peak and, and, and there are 10 different studies in 10 different populations and that there's always a peak in the same region, then the chances are that there's a major gene in there that's probably going to apply to a bunch of different populations. Well, this is the, the, going back to the science article, the, this is a region where there have been a number of people have found a, a, a peak there. Um, you, you know, the other problem here is, is that unlike single gene disorders, where there's a known mode of inheritance, you get everything under the kitchen sink here, right? So you get some of these genes are autosomal recessives, and some are autosomal dominants, and some are... Uh, 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 um, so. so you're getting a whole bunch of things jumbled up in one phenotype, which makes it very difficult. And then there's this problem of phenocopies. So what's a, what's a phenocopy? Yes. Give me a give me a give me an example from your own clinical experience of somebody who's a phenocopy who's not not due to a. Well, just like you can get these diseases from genes, you can get them from exposures in the environment. So what, what if you've got some guy who smokes four packs a day, and he's 50 years old, and he has a whopping big heart attack? Well, maybe he, you know, when you quiz him, he has no family history, but you smoke four packs a day. Well, you can get a heart attack from smoking four, four packs a day, and you don't need to have any genes at all for heart attack. You can just, so that's a phenocopy. He's going to look like somebody who's a genetic susceptible because he you know, had a heart attack at 50 years old, but it's all due to an environmental exposure. Um, incomplete penetrance. So this is, this is a problem even in single gene disorders, right? Because there are clearly examples. Um, hemochromatosis, cystic fibrosis, very different spectrum of diseases in these where we know that you know, the, the, uh, um, the, the CFTR gene causes cystic fibrosis. You've got some people who have completely normal lung function, no lung disease at all, and all they've got is mild pancreatic insufficiency, and you've got other people who were totally debilitated from it. So part of that can be penetrance, part of it can be environmental exposure, but incomplete penetrance is important. And then you've got this problem of multiple genes. You, you know, the, the people have very... Uh, the, the lay public has a very sort of delusional, con you know, they think the genes are immutable. You know, if you've got those genes, that's it. You, you know, it, it can't be changed. And they also, they're monolithic. They're really big. Whereas the reality is, is that anyone, you know, you got 33,000 genes in the genome. Take a disease like asthma, which isn't very complicated. Maybe they're 200, 250, I don't know, a lot that, that are probably important. Maybe 10 that play a, 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 a role in most every population um, and a lot of environmental things going on and it makes it very complicated and that's why guys like this guy are going to make big bucks because they're going to be able to model uh, all of the different pathways and you know all of the different genes together in some more realistic model of you know systems biology or some actual way of looking at this but the point here basically is look
it's complicated to do this stuff. But again, going back to what I said earlier, it's getting a lot easier. So 2002, one positionally cloned gene for asthma. 2003, two positionally cloned gene from, for, for, from asthma. 2004, first paper is already out, and there's probably going to be four or five more. So they're going to be four or five this year. The year after that, they're going to be probably 10. And all of a sudden, now you've got 20 genes identified for the disease by positional cloning. And that is the history of complex trait genetics, and it's going to be, it's, it's happening right now, right this very moment, all across the world. Labs like mine are right in the middle of the fray doing this stuff. This is, simply put, the single most exciting time to be doing human genetics, and uh, 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 it's going to go on for a while, but who knows for how long. Um, so then there's this other problem of pleiotropy, which is, you, you know, you could have one gene and it can do a lot of different things. You got the CFTR gene that gives you lung disease, pancreatic insufficiency, and fertility. You know, it all has to do with uh, mucosa and epithelia and different organ systems where this particular gene is expressed. So one of the genes we're looking at, um, so Jeff, did Jeff talk to you about uh, CRHR1? Did he show you the data about CRHR1 last week? So, 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 so that gene, gene is expressed. Is that gene expressed in the lung? Yes or no? Uh, no, not expressed in the lung. It's the, it's the receptor for CRF or CRH, and it's expressed in the brain. So. What other disease might that gene potentially be important in? He's an endocrinologist. He's forbidden from answering. What? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it comes from the hypothalamus, actually. So, yeah, clinical. What clinical disease? I just threw out hypertension. Hypertension? Yeah, uh, yeah, nah. Yeah. nah, there are endocrine causes of hypertension. Have you your physiology course yet? Uh, no. no. Right. <laughs> so, Anybody had physiology? Yeah, I mean, which, which axis? Was HPA? Okay, so um, hyperplasia or... No, come on, I think common disease is that. Common, common, common disease. Uh, I'll tell you, it's depression. It's it's actually, it's an, it's an it's been studied a huge amount and, you know, they've sectioned brains of people who committed suicide and this, I mean, all kinds of things sh show that CR CRF and CRHR1, which is the ligand and the receptor, are important in uh, uh, um, affective disorders. So is there any linkage to squalibrium? Well, uh, uh, there's an association between our capotype and depression really? in Julio Licinio's uh, Mexican-American. Really? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So that's pleiotropy, uh, and then obviously you've got this problem of penetrance that you, you know, which is individuals with a genotype who actually exp express the trait, and you, you know IgE genes can be important in hay fever, they can be important in asthma, uh, and and there are some people who don't have high IgE at all even though they've got the gene. So. Uh, um, and, and these are some other examples of things like the, the, the basic point I'm trying to make here is, is that these are reasons that have been given for why doing this stuff is hard. But I'll tell you something. The, really, the hard part has been developing the bioinformatics infrastructure, the tools, the bioinformatics tools, and cheap, reliable genotyping. That those have really been the things that have been important. Uh, and it, just in the little bit of time that I've been doing this, my genotyping costs are, have gone from $1.20 a SNP genotype down to next year, uh, I'll be down at about 15, 20 cents a SNP genotype. And, you know, there, there are 3 million SNPs minimum, 3 to 5 million in the human genome. Now, I'm not going to type 3 to 5 million, but I got to type in any one experiment, I got to be able to type. A thousand over a, a, a 10, 20 uh, um, megabase region. So, uh, it, you know, we're one of these linkage peaks. So, I got to do a lot of genotyping in a lot of people, and it's expensive. Uh, 
The very first positionally cloned gene for asthma took six years and $15.6 million. We could do that experiment today for $2 million and a regular NIH grant. And that has totally changed the field. That's the kind of thing that's really making this possible. Um, okay, so I already said that if you're, if you're going to think like a geneticist, Everybody has to know a little bit of population genetics. So you have to understand the concepts of linkage disequilibrium, drift, natural selection, et cetera, et cetera. I'm reminded of the fact that uh, somebody asked the President of the United States whether he believed in evolution, and his answer was, the jury's still out. <coughs> really? Yeah. That's what he said. Um, so, this is your former classmate, right? Right. Um, I went to high school with the President. Um, so, this is the first question that you're going to get asked if you're writing a grant. You know, the first thing that you have to address is, is the disease or the phenotype that you're interested in, is it heritable? So there's lots of different ways to measure this. You can calculate a, a heritability estimates, you can do twin studies, you can develop this concept of risk to relatives, which is, you know, you look at the risk. Uh, uh, um, uh, in, in the uh, uh, probands divided by, or the, or the relatives divided by the risk in the population at large, or you can look at familial aggregation. But the point is, you've got to gather the evidence, and if you don't know that your phenotype is heritable, you're going to have to demonstrate that it's heritable before anybody's going to give you a grant to study it, because that's what geneticists say. They say they want to know that. Um, they want to know the answer to that question. So I think it's, asthma doesn't necessarily have a high heritability, but it clearly is a heritable disease. This is data from one uh, 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 twin study from Danish Twin Registry that looked at the concordance of uh, um, asthma in identical and fraternal twins. Identical twins sh share 100% of their genotype. Fraternal twins uh, uh, um, share 50% uh, um, uh, 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 of their alleles. You know, everybody knows that twins also share the environment, so that's another factor that's at issue here. But the reality is, is that there clearly is evidence of heritability of the disease. You get very different, you know, the problem here is, is that heritability estimates are always dependent on uh, um, environmental exposures as well, because the true underlying model and disease prevalence. So the true underlying model for all of these diseases is clearly still going to be a gene by environment interaction. So after you've decided that the phenotypes that you're interested in are heritable, then you've got to go out and you've got to say, okay, I've got these phenotypes and I'm going to genotype them uh, in a population. You can either look at disease phenotypes, and the advantages of this is that people want to look at asthma. They want asthma genes. They, they, they want to find quote, the gene for asthma, unquote, which we already know is probably a false concept. Um, but the problem with a lot of disease phenotypes is, is that they, they, even though they may be binary clinically, they may be uh, real problems in terms of making that diagnosis in, in a way that would be useful for uh, a, a research study. Um, the problem with asthma is, is it's a syndrome, right? I mean, there is no one way of diagnosing asthma so that you can say, you take this test, and I can guarantee you that everybody that takes this test is going to have the disease, and everybody who has a negative test doesn't have the disease. Yeah, but the, the FEV1 doesn't tell you whether somebody's got asthma or not. I can show you people who have reduced FEV1 and have cystic fibrosis or have interstitial lung disease or have uh, uh, COPD, I mean, they can have a lot of different things, right? Uh, so it, it lacks sensitivity and specificity, the FEV1. And that's true for every single test. You know, I mean, uh, uh, elevated IgE. Well, you could have elevated IgE from parasitic disease or from uh, 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 eosinophilic pneumonia or from 20 other different things. So uh, there is no single test. And, and, and the same may be true for most complex traits. Um, there may be some phenotypes that are a little, little easier to measure, like, you know, say, well, I want to study obesity. Well, well is, how, is, fat is fat? how fat is fat? Or is people who are fat like this different from people who are fat like this? You know, I mean, there's all sorts of different ways of looking fat. So, 
uh, or being fat. So, y you know, any one of these phenotypes has complications. And, and, and I can tell you this, from, from when I first got into this, all I knew was phenotype. I was a world-class phenotyper. I knew all of the nuances of phenotype and everything there is to know about phenotype. And that tends to be what happens when you, when you talk to clinicians, because they understand that more. So this stuff is really, really important, but it's, it's not going to get you very far if you don't know all the other stuff. You've got to know all the other things. But, but I'm not, I think the point is, you do have to know this. And again, it's a... The current problem is a lot of genomics actually don't know this stuff. Exactly. Well, it goes back to the point that I was making earlier, which I think is, is that genetics is moving from a field where genetics were generalists to a field where geneticists are specialists. You get people who specialize in respiratory genetics, cardiovascular genetics, obesity genetics, diabetes genetics. The days of sort of the person that can roam around and do all of these things, no, 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 I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, in five years, six years, you're going to have to be able to go in there and focus on a specific disease because it's going to be too complicated for you to be, be able to do otherwise. Then you've got this other type of phenotypes where you can say, well, okay, we, we want to look at asthma, but what about looking at intermediate phenotypes? So give me some examples of an intermediate phenotype related to my disease of interest. What would be an intermediate phenotype? You heard one. Absolutely, FEV1. What else? I had it up on a number of slides. So IgE level, right? It's a measure of allergy. Skin test reactivity. Airways responsiveness. Um, symptom score. Sputum production. I mean, uh, uh, exhaled NO. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You could create hundreds. So, so for, for obesity, you could be looking at... Uh, uh, um, uh, body mass index is the primary phenotype to define obesity, but then you could look at absolute fat mass or percent body fat or uh, waist hip ratio or insulin resistance or uh, uh, um, uh, do CT scans of somebody's abdominal fat deposition. I mean, there's a million different ways of potentially going at this. The, the advantage here is, is that sometimes these are more objective than sort of a subjective, oh, it's asthma, it's not asthma. Um, and it may be, quote, closer to the gene in the sense that, you know, you got somebody's IgE level, you know, you have some idea of sort of genes that determine that. And it can be quantitative. You can do uh, uh, a different approach statistically to quantitative traits than you, you can use if you're looking at binary traits. Does this correlate then with like if someone comes in and, and uh, you, you look at them and say, okay, this person has a symptom of asthma, they have difficulty breathing and everything, then you start delving into, you know, like looking at the all these sub -fe inter intermediate phenotypes, and, and that does that that correlates then with like narrowing the diagnosis from okay, you don't really have asthma, you, you have this, or you have this type of asthma, or is that? Well, it's, 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 it's it, 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 the way I prefer to think about it, and I think it's probably a better way for you to think about it, is, is that you've you got to get away from This is where thinking like a doctor and a clinician is bad. In the world of clinical medicine, it's just like religion. You either have the disease or you don't. There's no such thing as being a little bit pregnant. You're pregnant or you're not pregnant, okay? You have, you, you have to have bypass surgery or you don't. Clinicians live in a binary world. Real scientists live in the world of continuous distributions. Okay, so so you, you know you can have uh, 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 when, when when are you fat? Are you fat with a body mass index of 23, 24, 25, 26? When do you high, when do you have high blood pressure? When it's 130 over 80 or 140 over 90 or you know, you know when, when, when is that? So I think that, the, and, and the other thing is, is that the way to think about these is kind of like overlapping Venn diagrams. The clinical phenotype is actually a composite of these overlapping Venn diagrams that are all have separate genetic determinants and uh, things that uh, 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 contribute to them. Separate genetic and environment, sort of like dissecting a layer and peeling an onion where you've got all these different uh, uh, um, uh, d different things. But I, I think in, in many ways, 
um, uh, being a clinician can help you as a research scientist, but in some ways it can also hurt because you, can, you start to think in these absolute terms. So I, I think the better way to think about it is is that these intermediate phenotypes overlap to create clinical phenotypes. And yes, you're, what you're trying to do is get stratify in some way or classify people in some way so you're, 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 you're creating homogeneity so that you can actually identify the genetic determinants of, uh, of, of, of a disease or an intermediate phenotype. So you're, you want to go in that direction, but, but most of these things lack sufficient sensitivity and specificity to really be uh, 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 ter terribly helpful. So this is just a list of some of the phenotypes that people have looked at in asthma. And I've starred some of the ones that um, uh, uh, people have focused on in terms of linkage peaks that have actually been identified. Um, but this is interesting because there's clearly a bias in the literature because there's a whole bunch of these other phenotypes where you could just as easy, and I could create a list, 30 more of these, where people haven't looked at. So, so this just gets to the point that there's plenty of work here for anybody who wants to do this stuff because you can go out, and I got a junior person in my lab. He's got a bunch of phenotypes that he's really interested in, and he's going to go out and he's going to determine their heritability, and then he's going to write another grant, and he's going to map the genes for them and so on and so forth because he, he wants to have his own little area to, to sort of work on. So then the next thing, so now we're, we're kind of at the point where, you, you know, you gotta, I'm going to move a little faster. We're not going to make our way through this, but you've got to have a study design. And there's a bunch of different ways of doing this, okay? You can do linkage, you can do association, uh, and, and amongst the linkage studies you can do allele sharing uh, um, uh, methods which are distribution free, or you can uh, um, uh, um, do sort of uh, um, continuous distributions and, and focus on that. There are two types of genetic association studies, the family-based and the case control. Important point here is, is that they're very different. You, you know, here you have to genotype uh, uh, three people. Here you have to genotype only two people. Different hypotheses. Uh, here you're looking at the uh, alleles or the uh, genotypes in the cases relative to the controls. It's the little frequency, the genotype frequency in the cases versus the controls here. You're looking at uh, um, uh, uh, transmitted alleles from a heterozygous parent to an affected offspring. Um, so very different hypotheses, different study designs. Uh, and important thing to recognize is that in any association study, um, the association between a variant and a phenotype can be due to a causal relationship, it can be the linkage uh, uh, of this equilibrium, or it can be due to population admixture, which means that in the, usually in the context of a case control study, not a family-based study, you've got different allele frequencies segregating in the cases and the controls because you've got different population histories, evolutionary histories, uh, 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 that have determined those allele frequencies. So the most extreme example would be I had a thousand Italian cases of asthma, and I'm comparing it to a thousand Swiss controls uh, uh, who don't have asthma. Uh, and even though these two groups are predominant, uh, are Caucasian, their evolutionary history may be different, and the allele frequencies may be different as a result of that. So th this is even within an ethnic group, you can get these different allele frequencies, and this is because ethnicity or self-designated ethnicity is only a weak predictor of evolutionary history. I don't know if it's your example or Marco's example. So if you compare a link, if you do a link, an association study for a pasta you do, you, you, between um, Germans and uh, Italians of two populations, sure enough, you find a, a, a linkage association between pasta eating and some peaks um, a genome because, in fact, what you'd be looking for is linkage to the fact that you're an Italian. <laughs> and just by the fact that the Italians have a distinct distribution of polymorphisms than the Germans, they're going to create this pasta association, when, in fact, what you're looking at is a different population. 
So these, uh, some of the guys in my lab wrote an article demonstrating all of the potential problems in the case control type of uh, a genetic association study. And one of the things that's really impressive about this paper in science is, is that we all use genetic association as part of the fine mapping process to map a linkage peak. But, this is a very important but, uh, uh, because uh, even if you can get rid of the population admixture problem, linkage to this equilibrium is always an issue. And so you're never going to know for sure if you're at the gene or you're just close by to it. And so you're going to have to have something else to show that you've actually found the gene. You're not getting into science just with genetic association. Okay, and so the people in the paper that's coming out this week, um, they have uh, 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 expressed the gene in bronchial tissue. They've uh, um, uh, 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 done immunohistochemistry to show that the gene is expressed in epithelium. Uh, they replicated their results in a different population, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the thing about the candidate, about, about, about the case control studies and about even family-based association is, is that these studies are really easy to do. And so there's lots of them in the literature. So it's really important for you to know, you know, going back to this slide, it's really important for you to sort of know these potential problems because you want to be able to read this literature and say, yeah, these guys really found something or maybe they didn't. So. The advantages of this candidate gene thing is, is that it's cheap and easy. The, 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 you compare, remember I said there are now four positionally cloned genes that have used this type of genome screen approach. Four that have been identified since the human genome was mapped in 1996. Well, you know, that's seven years. That's not even one gene a year. That's pretty meek or weak. And that's because this is very expensive, technologically intensive, but the thing that's great about this is you come up with a novel gene at the end of the time. So, you know, it's not dependent on what anybody knows about pathobiology. So you can go this way, you could say, look, I know that IgE is important in asthma. So I know that we ought to be screening IL-13, IL-4, IL-4 receptor, uh, 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 CTLA-4, all of those genes in the pathway that determines IgE. Makes sense, right? Screen those genes because we've already said that people with asthma have high IgE. Well, you, you know, you, you check those genes and yeah, in fact, they are, most of those genes are asthma or allergy genes. It's not kind of not real exciting though. You know, I mean, it's not like everybody's going to jump up and say, oh my God, you know, IL-13 is an asthma gene. Well, you know, the molecular biologist says, yeah, well, we knew that 10 years ago. So what's new? <laughs> what's great about that? Well, I mean, there are interesting things about it because you actually can get to the level. It's going to change molecular biology, too, because you're actually going to get the level where you say, well, it's these three variants in the promoter. It's this variant in exon 1. And it's this particular haplotype that's determining the effect on IgE level. So. Molecular biology is going to change because people aren't going to just be, aren't going to get away with knocking out a gene or, or, or looking at a whole gene effect. They're going to actually have to go in there and determine the particular variants that are important in terms of the molecular mechanisms. So I don't want to sort of denig denigrate this because I, this is, we do, all of us do a lot of this stuff to keep ourselves busy while we're trying to do these really big experiments that are very expensive and take a long time. Um, skip that. So let, let's talk a little bit about linkage. Linkage is this idea of you take these microsatellite markers all the way across the genome. Uh, uh, it's a property of families. It's not a property of individuals. And you're looking to see if there's a particular region of the genome contains a gene that's related to the phenotype of interest uh, that's segregating uh, in these families. Uh, um, uh, 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 using identity by descent. So. What you do is, you know, you have some extended pedigree like this. Uh, you, what you could do um, is you could do segregation analysis to develop a model uh, uh, to see how the disease is actually segregating in this population. But that's pretty difficult uh, for complex traits. It's not easy to do. Um, 
you could also use this approach, the allele sharing approach, which assumes no mode of inheritance. It just says we co collected a whole bunch of sib pairs who are affected, and we're going to test whether these affected rel relatives have inherited a region uh, of the genome identity by descent more often than expected under random M Mendelian segregation. And the nice thing about this is, is that it's easy, but it's not very powerful. I mean, the problem is you need a lot of SID pairs. Uh, uh, and even then, even with over 300 SID pairs, you don't get such great power um, using this approach. So uh, uh, um, p power goes up uh, if the disease is more heritable um, and you can do with less SID pairs. But the reality is, is that even with a huge number of SID pairs, you, you may not have a lot of power if the lambda uh, is down here. Uh, which it is for asthma, probably. So I think that this is why people have focused on extended pedigrees in these relative genetic isolates. And that's why we're so excited about Costa Rica. Uh, the Finns are clearly excited about Finland. And DECODE is doing what it's doing in Iceland. Um, whether we're going to be successful or not, I don't know. But um, the basic approach is, is that whether you're using an outbred population or a genetic isolate, and whether you're using sib pairs or pedigrees, is you've got these usually uh, die and try nucleotide re repeat uh, uh, STR microsatellite markers. Um, most of the genome services use about 400 of these markers equally randomly spaced across the genome. And what you do is you do just do a form of logistic regression, basically, where you do a log score, log of the odds ratio, calculation between relating phenotype in the family to these markers. And what you do is you get a peak, a linkage peak, that is the log score for that relationship between the markers and the, uh, uh, um, the phenotype. And what that says is, OK, there's a gene or multiple genes in this particular region on a chromosome that's associated with a particular phenotype. And then you have to then go in down and put more markers, first more STR markers and then micro, uh, uh, SNPs, and, and gradually map that region till you've actually got it down to a very, very small region of a particular you know, thousand base pairs or whatever, where you can say it's a gene or one or two genes in this uh, uh, relatively large region. So that's, that takes a lot of genotyping and a lot of work. So our experiments now, over the next year, we have all these linkage peaks in asthma and COPD. Each experiment is going to be about $200,000. There's going to be 1,500, 1,600 SNPs in each of these regions. And, and we're going to uh, find map three or four regions over the course of the next year. And hopefully, we will be in science. <laughs> What's the best of about, about the number of SNPs? About the SNPs? <sighs> you, you know, SNPs for 100 base pairs kind of thing. Um, on the order of one per, uh, yeah, one per thousand, about one per thousand basis. That's about what we're shooting for. So this is just a summary of all of the genome screens that have been done in asthma, just to show you that uh, uh, most of them have used been SID pair studies. Most of them have been relatively small. But we do get a substantial amount of replication. These are regions across the genome. This one right here, that's the gene that was just mapped. OK? Se several populations, including the Finns, showed a peak in this region. And um, they got this gene, and then they went to the, the, the Canadians, and they said, can we replicate it in your population? The interesting thing is, it was asthma in the Finns, but it's high IgE in the Canadians. So it shows you that this problem of phenotypic heterogeneity and genetic heterogeneity is a big issue uh, uh, here. So it isn't a perfect replication at the phenotype level between these two populations. But they've got all this other stuff, the expression and everything else, that uh, proves that they've really got the gene. Um, but the, the, one, the one we're working on is uh, um, actually not on here. It's, uh, I didn't leave it off intentionally. But it's, it's 12Q. Uh, and it's one of the ones that's the most replicable. Uh, here it is, here. It's on this slide right here. So this is, uh, this is a very good region. And there's mouse sentinel here. 
um, but it's also got a very low p-value. So that's one of the better ones. Now, you, you know, you can already see from this, each one of these, this region has five or six different genes in this region. There's the cytokine cluster is here, beta-2 adrenergic receptor is here, IL-13 is here, CD14 is here. So there's a whole bunch of small genes in here. Nobody knows whether there's a big, big gene or not. You know, maybe that that linkage peak is just being given by the fact that there's a whole bunch of small genes in, 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 in that region. Um, this, this one, the one we're working in, this is uh, 30 megabases. It's huge, huge region. So, uh, but, but you can see from just looking at this that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and there's another, th I mean, these are 20 regions, each of them about 20 to 30, 20 to 40 megabases. They, there could be five or six genes in each one of these regions, and at least two of the positionally cloned genes, there were two genes in the region. And, and, it, and you couldn't tell from the articles, in fact, this Finnish article that's about to come out, you can, there's a second gene they identified, and they don't have the molecular biology on that in the paper. And they don't, they're not sure what that gene is doing. So you're actually going to do a 5.5 or 1% of the entire human genome? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So these are some of the issues in doing the type of linkage studies that I talked about. Multiple markers, multiple phenotypes, multiple comparisons. Phenotypes are correlated. Markers not independent. You know, you got to do. So there's a lot of statistical issues. You know, this this work is really exciting, I think, because it combines genetics, clinical medicine, molecular genetics, statistics. Evolutionary, it's all of this stuff is all mixed together. So it's a lot of important statistical issues in doing these genome screens. So then you've got to genotype the people. We've already said that you know, SNPs are the primary genetic variation in the human genome. But we found indels, we found uh, uh, repeats, we found uh, uh, um, SNPs and indels together. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, in general, SNPs occur about you know, between one and a thousand and one and two thousand base pairs, there are approximately three, um, maybe three to five million in the human genome. And, it, you know, it's using these as the primary source of genetic variation that we're actually sort of going at trying to map these genes. There's a whole host of questions about how do you pick SNPs? You know, we wrote a paper together, Zach and I, with some of our colleagues about haplotype tagging SNPs. Uh, uh, um, there's other approaches to using linkage disequilibrium to define the SNPs that you want to genotype. So lots of issues there uh, where sort of bioinformatics is interfacing with human genetics. Um, no one really knows, you know, this is probably not 30 million, this, you know, this is probably three, uh, um, but, y you know, no one really knows how many of these SNPs are actually coding. And I think everybody does know that there are more than coding SNPs that are important. Promoter SNPs are important. Coding SNPs are important. SNPs in the 3' prime UTR are important because they're going to change transcription factor binding and potentially change message level. Whole host of different, and, and, and any one SNP is probably in and of itself isn't going to change function in a gene all that dramatically. So people are going towards this idea of you know, analyzing data at the molecular level by looking at relevant functional haplotypes. You know, if you've got a couple SNPs in the promoter, uh, um, y y you know, another that's a, a non-synonymous C SNP and an exon, another that's uh, um, at uh, um, a, a, a splice site, uh, another that's in the 3' prime UTR that's determining message level of stability, you combine all of those SNPs to try to get an effect across that whole gene uh, in terms of looking at that gene and its impact on, on phenotype. Um, so this is just a little bit about data analysis. You know, you can either look at continuous quantitative, uh, uh, quantitative traits or qualitative traits. There are parametric and non-parametric approaches to this. Um, then you, you, know, you use all the stuff, you actually find the gene. Um, I think that people are not doing, the initial work was done with yak and bat clones, but now we're past the idea of doing that because there's enough markers with a HapMap project across the genome that we can go into almost any region now 
in the genome and we can come up with uh, um, validated SNPs across that region so that we can actually pick SNPs and genotype them and go directly. And this is what's accelerating the pace of uh, uh, positional cloning uh, at the moment. Um, so these are some of the things that I haven't really talked about this. This is introductory, this lecture, but you know, you really get into this. You know, you, how do you do haplotype analysis, uh, uh, ancestral haplotype analysis, or linkage disequilibrium mapping, uh, um, molecular methods, or, or tissue expression? All of these things can potentially be helpful in the fine mapping process. We, you know, we, we've been very interested in having a project with Zach where we wanted to use mouse expression and mouse QTL analysis to help us with human. Uh, a positional cloning. We're not sure if our project's going to be funded, so we don't know if we're actually going to get a chance to do that. At the end of the day, you want to be able to look at the impact of polymorphic variation in the gene that you found and see whether that polymorphic, how much of the phenotypic variance is explained by that uh, uh, of polymorphism. And that gets back to this question of, well, you found a gene by positional cloning. How do you know it's really a significant gene? Well. Does it replicate across different populations in different conditions? Is it important in different kinds of asthma? Uh, uh, does it seem to be explaining a significant amount of the variation? So th this is one example. It's a poor example because it's not, a, it's not a really good one. This is a gene, CD14, that we genotyped in the program in genomic applications. This gene is the um, a gene that uh, uh, binds uh, uh, LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Uh, to the membrane of the monocyte and then transduces that signal uh, to the T cell to produce uh, a Th1 cytokines. So uh, we found a polymorphism in this gene as part of the program in genomic applications. It's a C to T polymorphism. So here's the uh, um, uh, um, T variant. Here's the uh, uh, heterozygote and here's the C. And you can see that uh, um, if you look at a dominant model where the Cs are together, the uh, anybody that has a C uh, um, a genotype actually is likely to have more positive skin tests than those who are TT. And th that genetic variation is associated with variation in soluble uh, 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 CD14 levels in peripheral blood. So there's a relationship between genotype and uh, 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 um, intermediate phenotype and a relationship to the, the, the uh, to allergy ultimately. Uh, I'm sorry, was, it, was that supposed to show a difference between the two? Small, but it was significant. Okay. Well, I think the point here is, is that this is one SNP. You know, this gets back to the point that, you know, it's not even a haplotype in this gene uh, and, and still there is, a, and you know, these are mo modest numbers, they're not huge, but there, but there was clearly a difference. Um, probably the sort of level of difference you'd expect if it was just a single SNP. I mean, it's, uh, it's, none of these effects are going to be very large at the level of an individual variant. At the level of a gene with a haplotype, with a really significant gene, maybe so, but, but not certainly not one SNP. So these are some of the skills that if you guys want to do this work, if you were going to come to my laboratory, I would want you to know something about it. You know, you, 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 you'd want to be you want to know something about this and how to genotype the natural history of the disease, study design, statistical methodology, phenotyping, environmental exposures, and I probably ought to add to this list bioinformatics uh, because without good bioinformatics skills, you're going to be lost. Uh, and you know, it's hard to know exactly where on the spectrum you know people want to sort of you could do this and never have anything to do with the phenotyping and just focus on the functional variation uh, from genes that these guys are, uh, are actually finding, or you might sort of situate yourself somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, I've got people in my lab that are doing just this, and uh, um, very few people that are doing just this, but I have some that are sitting in the middle. Um, so where is this going in the future? I mean, I think that uh, um, what's driving the field is high throughput sequencing and high throughput genotyping combined with bioinformatics in the presence of having lots of populations to do this kind of work. You know, that's what's really necessary is you've got to have well phenotyped populations. In my lab, these are all the different populations that we have for asthma. We've got these extended pedigrees. 
we've got affected SID pairs, we've got trios, and we've got uh, individual cases and controls uh, so that we can test the genes in multiple different populations and, and, and uh, uh, under different uh, conditions. So why don't I stop there and I'd be glad to answer any questions that people have about any of the things that I said. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that means is, is that, you know, actually getting into, you know, once you, once you've got a relationship with a gene, what you have to do is re really get down and figure out what are the variants in that gene and what are they doing. And, and that, that can proceed. Human genetics can contribute to that at the level of genetic association. So, for example, we, um, Lori Glimpshire, who's an immunologist at the School of Public Health, uh, <coughs> identified a gene that controls uh, uh, T cell differentiation. Uh, uh, it's TBX21, or TBET is the name of the gene. And she created a knockout mouse, and uh, uh, when you knock this gene out in the mouse, you get tremendous airways responsiveness and allergic inflammation. It looks like an asthma gene in the mouse. And, and, and so we sequenced that gene, and then we started to uh, um, look at, we found a variant in the gene that's in the coding region. It's, it's a non-synonymous C-SNP in the coding region. It's very rare. It only occurs in about 3% of people. But it turns out that that coding region variant is, uh, um, determines which patients who get inhaled steroids get better. The people that have that variant and get inhaled steroids have their airways responsiveness completely returned to normal. We're about to submit it to the Lancet. We're actually working with Lori to pretty exciting though, isn't it? It's, it's, it's exciting because it's an example of how you can actually, you don't have to even go to the animal model. And so she then cre has created, you know, her mouse model, she started to do some experiments with steroids, and steroids are probably important in controlling TBED expression. And she didn't know that. So that's an example of structure function relationships where you know, you're trying to figure out what a gene actually does. And it's, it is important to recognize there are some genes that have been around for a while and, and people still don't, we know there's a relationship to a disease phenotype, but we don't know how the hell they work. So figuring out that structure function stuff can take a long time potentially. Uh, and doing the genetic association and the fine mapping may actually now proceed at a faster pace and, and not take as much time. Uh, um, but I think it's, um, uh, um, you can actually do a lot of structure function stuff. Y usually what we do is when we get an association, we will type every damn variant, we'll, we'll sequence that gene, we'll type every damn variant we can find in that gene in, in the population and look at everything that could be related to a, 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 an interesting phenotype because we're searching for clues to how to help our molecular biology colleagues in uh, uh, trying to help them uh, figure out what the gene is actually doing. Well, you could do that. I mean, so we're trying to work with this guy. Uh, uh, he's got people in his lab who have ideas about how to uh, uh, get clues. So, so like the stuff that Drazen showed you last week, that gene, CRHR1, we, we know there's a relationship to steroid treatment response, but we don't know what the variant is in the gene. So we sequenced the gene completely, and now we've got two indels in that gene that sit right at intron exon junctions. So the, the presumed, what we're thinking is that those insertion deletion polymorphisms may be changing alternative splice sites. So we're going to have to try to prove that. That's one of the hypotheses that we're going to investigate in the renewal of the grant, is trying to look at that. Um, we also, uh, um, so, so 
you, you, know, you have to let the gene tell you where its variation is and, and how it might be uh, uh, um, contributing the phenotype. And so uh, uh, the first thing usually is to sequence the gene completely. Second thing would be to then do a very careful analysis of the new variants and the resequenced variants that you found in relationship to the phenotype of interest uh, or phenotypes of interest and see if you can find either haplotypes or individual SNPs or insertion deletion polymorphisms or transcription factor binding sites or things that could potentially explain the genetic association. So then you can do that and then you have to go into an animal model and test those uh, in a more rigorous way usually. So Scott, how far off do you think is a day when a clinician at a Brigham will be able to come with you and say, I have a disease, I have 500 patients, cases, and 500 controls, and I think uh, I want to verify that with a fine map that this is on the long arm of a chromosome, uh, and I want to do this for 100,000 dollars. Um, so you're really asking the question is, I think the question you're asking is, how far away is whole genome association? How far away is whole genome association where it's within the reach of significant but not impossible clinical studies? Uh, max three years. Max. All right. I mean, George Church. It's all about the genotyping costs, yeah. Zach. With I mean, it's, with his colleagues, he might be able to. I mean, he he listen. He thinks he's close to you know the thousand dollar genome. So if he's really close to the thousand dollar genome, and genotyping SNP genotyping costs really drop, continue to drop as dramatically as they've dropped over the last three years, um, I, I would see whole genome association being within the range uh, of uh, uh, um, a reasonable budget, you know, in a two or three year period of time. Very good. All right, on that note, thank you very much, Scott. <laughs> and